I'm looking at the adjusted present value technique. So the APV, and I said this is uh, based on the M and M proposition two with with tax. And what does it say? It says the value of a geared company is equal to the value of an equivalent an equivalent and geared company plus um, is tax um, shield. Okay, so that is where we're looking at the VG equals to the VU plus the DT. Okay, so what does it mean? What is the justification for the use of this model? It is important that students um, understand the justification for using um, the APV. And that is quite simple. Where the method of funding a project or call it a new project will significantly alter the existing proportion of debt and um, equity in a company's capital structure. Then our existing work will no longer be um, applicable. So then, from this, once it's going to alter our existing gearing, then we can extend this to say the value of a geared project is equal to value of an equivalent and geared project, this time we say the present value of its financing side effects. Now, what are the financing side effects? These are the pointers to the use of this um, model. Now, one of them could be things like debt capacity being offered by the project, issue costs of finance, and then tax benefits, and then things like cheap or subsidized loans. So we'll be looking at all these cheap or subsidized loans, issue cost of finance, 
the moment you begin to read this from a question, then is is a pointer to the use of the adjusted present value technique. Now, how is this different from the conventional NPV? With a conventional NPV, we assume business risks may change, but then the financial risks, which is a measure of the gearing, will remain intact. So with the APV, what it says is the APV will mean that let us separate what the investment decision from the financing decision, meaning that if the gearing is not is going to change, then we will separate investment decision from financing decision. And the investment decision is nothing more than our usual MPVs. But then this is what we do. We are going to appraise the investment as if it were all equity financed. That is no debt. And we'll do this by discounting cash flows by the cost of ungeared equity. This is very, 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 very important. Cost of ungeared equity. Now, earlier on, we said this cost of ungeared equity there are two means by which we should be looking for this. Under the capital asset pricing model, we said this cost of ungeared equity is the risk fee rate plus equity risk premium. Then what we need is the asset beta. Now, either we get this or via the M and M, we make KEU, which is part of the earlier formula that we looked at, the subject, this pen is playing up. We make KEU the subject of the following formula, which already is provided. So we have the KEG equal to the KEU we are looking for if we have, and then we have market value of debt after tax, market value of equity, and then the KEU less the yield to maturity of the debt. So don't forget this is still your usual yield to maturity. So if we have information on beta, then we go for the capital asset pricing model. The moment we don't find any information on beta, but we still need to do the APV, then it is likely we'll have sufficient information um, to go by the M&M &M, um, way. So the investment decision, which is the usual MPVs will be done or discounted with KEU. That is what makes APV different from the conventional MPV. So the layout for MPVs will stay the same. Nothing will change 
but what you'll be looking out for is your discount factor should be the cost of equity and gear. Now, then, like we said, we will separate investment decision from financing decision. And so, the financing decision, this is what we do. We will discount all financing cash flows, i.e., the tax relief on interest, any issue cost there, subsidized loans, we will discount this with preferably one, the yield to maturity or the risk free rate. There's a case for using any of them, but oftentimes for this examination, the preferred bit is the yield to maturity. So take note, the yield to maturity or the normal cost of borrowing. The normal cost of borrowing will become a discount factor. So what it means is we use separate discount factors for the two different sections. So for our investment decision, our discount factor is cost of equity without gearing. And then for the financing decision, it is our yield to maturity or the normal cost of borrowing. So where you read normal cost of borrowing, that could be or that should be um, normal cost of borrowing pre-tax. That is what we will be looking at. Now, I want us to look at a few things here and there regarding this bit connected with cheap or subsidized loan. Now, with a cheap or subsidized loan, these are a couple of things we want to look at. Now, what we mean by a cheap or subsidized loan? Say, for example, the it will cost you 10% to raise a normal debt, but you may have received a cheaper loan offering a, um, a cost of, say, 8%. Now, what you do see is you're going to save 2% on the loan over the period of the, um, the project. Now, these savings would also mean that you'll be losing tax relief you would have otherwise earned on um, the interest uh, on the 2% that you saved. So two things come up with the cheap or subsidized loan. We save in interest, but then we also lose tax savings on the interest um, allowed for tax purposes. So that is what we will be looking at the savings on loans. So for this, there will be Savings on interest and then tax relief lost on saved words interest. So that is what we will be looking at. Then if we take the interest on the debt, for example, then it is the debt amount D times the coupon times the tax rate. That is what we'll be looking at going forward. So it is nothing new from our usual MPV except for the fact that we will separate investment decision from financing decision because our existing work will no longer be um, applicable. So we'll take a very basic example to see how this is um, looked at. So let's look at this 
basic example here. So if we take this as um, an illustration, just to demonstrate the um, APV uh, principle, it says the managers of Zenka are investigating a potential 25 million um, investment. So presumably this is uh, the initial capital. And then it says the investment will be a diversification away from existing mainstream activities into the printing industry. Now, six million of the investment will be financed from internal sources and then 10 million by rice issue, that makes it 16. And then the other nine from long-term loans. So call it, this will be our debt. And then it says, the investment is expected to generate pre-tax net cash inflows of approximately 5 million per year for a period of uh, 10 um, years. And then we are told that the residual value at the end of the 10-year period is forecast to be um, 5 million after tax. So we need to consider that in the MPV. Now, it says, as the investment is in an area that the government wishes to develop, it is given a subsidized loan of 4 million out of the total 9 million debt available. So then that leaves us with um, 5 million from normal sources. And it said this will cost 200 basis points below the normal cost of long-term debt, which is that. So then this is our yield to maturity and it's all our cost of debt, which is our discount factor for the financing bit of the APV. Now, it says Zenka's equity beta is 0 0.5 and its financial gearing is 60, 70 by market values. The average equity beta in the printing industry, which is where they are going, is 1.2. Don't forget this is equity beta and average gearing by market value is 50 50. The risk free rate, which is the RF, is 5.5 with an equity risk premium of 6.5. So RM minus RF. Issue cost, yes, that is another pointer to the use of APV. Um, excluding the subsidized loan is 1% for the debt and 4% for the equity financing. And it can be assumed that the debt capacity available to the company is equal to the amount of debt or finance raised for the investment. And these costs are not tax deductible, meaning the issue costs are not tax deductible. Corporation tax rate is 30 percent let us assume that tax payments and refunds are made in the same year without delay and what we are required to do is to estimate the adjusted present value of the proposed um, investment now if you have something like this which could come in a bigger it's just about the approach as we said, or as I said, um, we, we will separate investment decision from financing decision. So our first point is to deal with the investment um, decision. Now with the investment decision, we should be looking at our cost of equity and geared, which is the measure of business risk so the first thing i want to do is to find keu which is the business 
risk, discount rate. Now, from the information we are given, we note that we have some beaters. So, a price, suppose that we don't need to go the M and M route, then it means that our KEU will be the risk free rate. This and then the appropriate discount factor will be asset um, beta. So what do we have? What do we need? We have risk free rate over there, 5.5%. Equity risk premium, 6.5%. I can find that. What I need is an asset beta. And earlier on, we said for the asset beta, all we need to do is go to the printing industry. If they have an asset beta, given in the question, fair enough. If not, do they have an equity beta? If yes, then we have to ungear this. So, ungearing or call it degearing equity beta in the printing industry this equity beta will simply be a new asset beta will be 1.2 equal to in that industry we're told it is 50 50 so following from the previous video this should be uh, a pretty straightforward something and that gives you 0 0.706 which is the me measure of business risks in the printing um, industry so get this right the measure of business risk in the print or printing industry okay so from here we can now just slot this in here and that should give us a discount rate of approximately 10 um, percent so our ungeared cost of equity will come out as approximately 10%. And I hope um, this is quite clear. So, I'm gearing that, and that is where we have this to be um, an ungeared cost of equity of 10% from this previous illustration here. It is important we find this out quite early in the process and we move on to look at the MPV. Now, coming back to the question, it says it is expected to generate pre-tax net cash flows. Pre-tax meaning that these cash flows of 5 million are yet to be taxed and we have a tax rate of 30% for a period of 10 years. Now, that sh should make us think about using annuities for the purposes of being efficient or to save time. So, if we come here knowing that we have 10%, this is what we are looking for. We have this as 10%, which is what we have here. Annual after tax cash flow comes to 3.5 million every year. So, Using 10% as our discount factor, you have annuity factor for um, 10 years at 10%. 
giving us um, um, 6.145. So that gives us that value. But the residual value is one off. This is a one off cash flow. So what it means is we've got to find the present value factor in the 10th year at 10%. And that is this bit here, multiplying that by this, and that gives us that. So this less the initial capital gives us a negative MPV of 1.562 that. So this is nothing new. And the name for this MPV is base case MPV. Just to distinguish that from uh, the traditional MPV, we say this is base case MPV, meaning that just looking at the business side of it, just the business side of it, this is what it is. This is what we're looking at. So what you realize is from the business perspective, without considering how the business is financed, it doesn't look attractive. So now we come to look at what does the financing bring? And that is one benefit of the APV. Before, because it separates investment decision from financing decision, we can tell which of the two parts adds more value than the other, if you want to look at it from that point. So financing decision, we are looking at the effect of the tax shield on interest, the subsidized loan, the issue cost associated with external financing, and then we take it from there. So this is the debt times the normal rate times the tax. So then this is the normal loan because it's a composition on, of uh, 9 million in all. The total debt, so the cheap bit, Now this pen is playing up. So the cheap loan, so this is 5 million, that is 4 million, and all together the debt funding is 9 um, uh, million. And so D times R times T gives us the annual tax relief. All together gives us uh, 192,000. Uh, Again, what is our discount factor here? This is our normal cost of borrowing. That is important. We are no longer using the 10% because we have now reached the financing decision. And our normal cost of borrowing for 10 years at 8%. So we're looking at annuity factor for uh, 10 years this time as at 8%. And that should be giving us that. Now, so when these two are multiplied, then we arrive at... So you notice that the tax benefits expected alone is 1.2, nearly 1.3 million dollars. Now, we're now going to look at the cheap or subsidized loan. For the cheap loan, what do we save? What do we lose as tax relief? And then we knock off the issue cost. So every year, we will be saving 2% on the entire 4 million. That is that value there. And then tax relief lost on this is for these savings, we are losing 30%. And so the net savings per annum on the debt is that, again, at the same annuity factor, present value of annual net savings on the cheap loan comes to 
um, this bid there. So that is a positive figure. Then issue cost, don't forget, is an outflow. For the debt finance, it says it's 1%. For the equity, the rice issue, we saw that was 4%. So all together, 450,000. Um, so when it's all said and done, we have this as the base case. We have this as the present value of annual tax relief. Then the present value of annual net savings on cheap loan comes to um, this bit there and then issue cost coming up with that. So what we do get is if we add on one, two, eight, eight, three, two, zero, knock off one, five, six, two, five hundred, and then add on three, seven, five, seven, sixty, then knock off four, fifty, we have negative negative three four eight this and so based on this estimate um, the project is not financially viable so um, a huge chunk of the reason is because from the business side as you can see it is not good and that is um, the main reason for um, the overall APV being negative. And so, in, sim in simple terms, this is not a project to go in for. So, yes, this is the technique. And as I said, the justification for this technique is where the method of funding the new project will change the historic proportions of debt and equity in our capital structure. Say, for example, if we have a 50-50 gearing on our current uh, as a capital structure and we are going to solely fund a huge project by issuing bonds without any equity component, which is likely to alter our existing gearing. And so in that case, we will separate investment decision from financing decision. And when we do that, then we have to resort to the APV. So in summary, putting the two videos uh, sort of together, then this is um, what we could say that when do we use what? Where we have same business risks same financial risks or call it same gearing then the current cost of capital or the work will be appropriate. Now, where there is diversification or one would say different business risk, then we may need to use the risk adjusted um, cost of capital. So then there will be the need to ungear and regear where necessary. But the moment there is a change in gearing, i.e. different financial 
risk. It doesn't matter whether we are in the same industry or diversifying. We will separate investment decision from a financing decision. So in this bracket, this is where we would always have to what, separate investment decision from financing decision. And I hope um, this video will help you appreciate the APV technique. Thank you.